Hi, welcome to episode five of The Focus. I'm Aldo Roll. And I'm Horia Sloshansky. Welcome. Okay, so today we're moving on to uh, the next uh, pair, polarity pair uh, that we have on our galaxy view. And that is looking at that interplay between personal interest and organizational purpose we're going to be looking at what is it that we need to get or what is it that we're aiming or towards to get balance between those two aspects of it. But before we start in that, just a reminder, that's our galaxy view and how we're going to step through this as well is by looking at the polarity map. And again, we are going to be looking, first of all, at uh, the uh, current struggle patterns, which is uh, down to the bottom left. Then we're gonna go up to the desired outcomes we want of organizational purpose. Then we'll cover the risks when we overcorrect on organizational purpose and not keeping personal interest in mind. And then we're gonna look at what's the benefits to be retained from having a focus on personal interest as well. We'll then look at what's the upside if we have those in both the overall purpose or the greater purpose statement, which we call the thriving zone in our uh, galaxy model. And then we'll be looking at actions and skills that can keep us or, uh, and, and capabilities that will keep us above the line there in order to keep serving that overall purpose. And then we'll be looking at early warning signs that we can um, actually measure or observe that um, uh, will tell us whether we're falling back into the downside of either or both of those um, polarities. So jumping in there, we call this personal interest and organizational purpose for a reason. So that reasons um, we, we will be discussing shortly. And we believe that we've noticed some things about why do we think this is a balance? Aurea, why is this important as a balance? When we're talking about governance, oversight of a particular initiative, there's always a power gradient. Somebody is in charge, somebody is following the lead. Very few organizations have much more of a collegial approach. So when it comes to somebody in charge, we have a, a significant risk. There's um, a great possibility that ego will come into play. Uh, and unchecked ego then gives rise to all manner of tyrannical um, behavior. We see people sometimes feeling inwardly uncertain, insecure, uh, afraid, um, they have a feeling of imposter syndrome, and therefore they must posture, they must display arrogance. We have people that are sometimes simply so enamored with themselves. Uh, there's so much um, written and spoken about self-esteem and so on and so forth, forgetting that, well, um, what matters enormously in life is not so much how much we appreciate ourselves, but how can we be a value to others so that they can appreciate us and in turn, um, we appreciate each other, right? That's way more effective than just focusing on self-esteem, right? Uh, we get, uh, unfortunately, sometimes psychopathical um, behavior. And some um, scary research suggests that people in position of authority have um, uh, a higher proportion of uh, people exhibiting psychopathic behavior than you might find otherwise in uh, the general population, particularly because um, we seem to appreciate these people that push and get things done, regardless of how it harms or, or damages other people's um, sort of well-being. 
Yeah, it's those silent assassin types uh, that we've observed. When you sort of don't really have good empathy with people, you may have some some difficulty. Sometimes we get um, ethical drift. Uh, that essentially means that we get accustomed with um, erosion of ethics, and from day to day we get worse and worse and worse, and pretty soon we end up with a catastrophe like. Um, um, some people may not even remember the scandals around Enron and Tyco and so on, where big corporations engaged in ridiculous um, misbehaviors. So um, essentially, personal interest um, or um, small community interest versus the broader organizational purpose is a fundamental tension that we have in organizations, in society, in all sorts of areas of life. What do I want, me, myself, versus, hold on a second, but I'm not alone. I'm part of a broader community. What do we want to achieve as a community? What's our spirit? What's our intention? What's our purpose as a community? And if our interests are at odds if the organization tries to achieve something and i don't want that i want something else for me then we're in trouble however if we manage to align my interest is whoa i'm so passionate about this i so care about this my interest is hey it's exactly what this organization wants i'm a perfect fit for this organization I, i'm so in tune with what this organization wants to achieve well hey then we have something really magical because so I really some, want to contribute. But there's some really interesting um, ideas to explore with what you've just said. I mean, it even then goes as far as to how do you recruit um, and how do you find a niche for somebody in your organization? How do you make sure that um, that person or people in your organization find their niche so that they have that personal alignment with what the organization is going to achieve. Um, right. So it, 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 it's not just about looking at the narcissistic, uh, arrogant, psychopathic um, and ethical drift, uh, but it's also going much further into, from an oversight perspective, what are the things that you need to consider that you can actually make it uh, so to make it create conditions in your organization so that people want to work for you and remain aligned with your vision. That, that, that's one of the other things. Um, another thing that we've also noticed is that um, it's, a, it's also harmonizing individual values with uh, what an organization stands for and what they're trying to achieve. For instance, we won't find a Buddhist monk for working as a weapon smuggler. Um, if that, if you find that, then we definitely want to know about that. Uh, if you see that, but it is about that personal values being aligned with what the organization is, is being achieved. And we notice uh, out there, um, there's a lot of people that really struggles with that alignment because the organization is doing something that they don't personally agree with um, and you know th those are the people that would end up leaving for the for first opportunity they get yeah, leave the organization and that's a costly uh, exercise so Horia, um, I, I know I asked you why about this polarity uh, do you think that we how well do you think we've covered that um, as, as a question well, I think we got the, the gist across that we cannot afford to consider governance and oversight without digging into what's in it for the individuals, um, both the ones leading or contributing to the oversight function and the people doing the work. Everybody will have personal interests. And what really matters is coordinating and aligning the interests of people such that we have a good harmonious result. Where we have difficulty is where there's a difference in intention and expectation, and therefore that needs to be addressed. That's why uh, we feel balancing personal interests with the organizational purpose really needs to be um, dealt with well. Thank you.
So without further ado, I'm, I'm going to jump straight into the first one. And this is where we look at the downside of having too much personal interest. Um, and this is the bottom left of the polarity map uh, that, we, that we're stepping through. And this is looking at the struggle patterns we have with an overfocus on personal interest. What we noticed is that, first of all, is that in many of those cases, if you've got an uh, unclear organizational purpose, you'll start seeing uh, quite a lot of personal interests coming to the fore a lot more and a lot more pronounced. The uh, next one that um, uh, goes, uh, that follows that, is um, even in a, even if you have a clear organizational purpose, people may be so focused on their positional allocation. Um, and that is something we've noticed. I'm not pointing fingers at any specific government, but we have seen some of that in some government organizations is the positional allocation um, uh, brings with it in that culture a certain amount of ruthlessness uh, or uh, psychopathy, uh, to call it that. So that positional allocation by default um, is something we notice that, um, and our panel have noticed, is that uh, people behave in such a way because I have, I've, I'm carrying the crown in the space so I can do what I want. We then have a contrast uh, of two phenomena that we see depending on the, the context and the, the culture of the organization. You either have individuals with a very high personal interest in what it is that they do in the organization. Um, so for instance, uh, th this is enforced through uh, people sitting potentially at the top of a silo or perhaps a group or a specific silo themselves. And then contrasting with that is low personal interest. People just turn up for a paycheck and they don't really care. Um, so there's that high or low personal interest that we notice that if uh, uh, something isn't really right when it comes to that alignment of personal interest with organizational purpose. Um, some behaviors that we do notice that leads to some of the personal interest, low personal interest, um, is treating people like numbers, treating them like children. Those are the typical type of patterns that would immediately lead to low personal interest in the organization um, or low personal interest per se. Then lastly is, again, we, we, we keep repeating this mantra of conflict in all the uh, patterns uh, or all the uh, balances that we're doing. And this is this conflict of interest between personalities. Um, I've worked uh, with, uh, in, within an organization and I've noticed that we had a scrum master and a project manager and it was actually a turf war between the two of them um, uh, uh, in, inside that context about who's actually in control. Um, and that just caused so much havoc for the team. And you should see the, you, it was astounding to look at the shenanigans that went on behind the scenes where the one tried to do something with the team and the other one was always trying to do something else with the team. And it just, was, just wasn't working. It was really like a comedy sometimes, a really dysfunctional comedy. So in a nutshell, that's what we're looking at. The downside is all sorts of patterns of behavior and habits around um, the downside of over-focusing on personal interest too much. Aurea is gonna be discussing a little bit about what does it look like when we have a good solid focus? What's the upside on the desired outcomes with having a strong organizational um, purpose? Mm. Well, um, we're hoping to see that the composition of the oversight function is very well thought out. In other words, it includes the right people at the right time, particularly if you're trying to do it in an adaptive fashion, you um, are expecting to get together every few days, not just once a quarter or something like that, like some of the 
um, older approaches to oversight or even monthly, right? You can have rapid access to the people that are needed. You swarm around the particular oversight concern and you address it right then, right there. You can be a lot more dynamic. We're hoping to see a lot more excellence in leadership. Uh, we're hoping to see that when you have really good organizational purpose clearly understood, everybody's clear on it. Everybody can uh, pick up the mantle of leadership and inspire people to achieve that. You know an organization has a really well-articulated organizational purpose if you ask five people and they give you pretty much the same answer or even, even simpler. They point on the wall and say, that's it. See, we wrote it down. So we, we never forget. You have clarity of habit, clarity of, of understanding. That also then generates this purpose alignment. It's very easy to, for you to say, you know what? Yeah, this matters to me. I'm going to work here. It makes it hard for you to say, nah, I don't really care much about this. But hey, it's a living. Who cares? Yeah, because then if you have everybody in the organization actively being engaged and, and genuinely interested, there will be social pressure to say, mate, uh, come on, uh, if you don't care about this, get out of here. Do something else with your life. We really love this. We'd love for you to love it. But if you don't, get out of here and do something else or join us. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, dynamic there of keeping each other honest as to if we believe in this and we, if we care about this, we're going to put energy in it and we're going to have really good uh, alignment. That is the essence of win-win. There has to be some form of we're in this together. We care about each other to uh, deliver this great outcome for the people that we serve. It matters to us. It's important to us. We are happy to sacrifice our time and energy into this. We're making it sacred. It is something that we genuinely care about. That's what sacrifice, this is what sacred means. So those last three, uh, uh, the purpose, alignment, the win-win, and the leadership excellence that you talked about, um, just think back at the start of the pandemic and you look at how some countries um, have actually um, worked to uh, overcoming the disruption that the pandemic, the, the COVID pandemic brought, brought about. We saw this, we saw leadership excellence, we saw that purpose alignment. You just, all you just needed to go look at in those countries is to look at the actual narrative that, that was had and what was the win-win they were looking for for everybody. It was really evident, it was such a great example. Sorry, Aurea, I just uh, wanted to no worries. throw that in there. It makes but a lot of sense. Yeah. As time went on, we saw that certain personal interests started creeping in, and it was not about the greater good anymore mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in, in some of those, those countries. It was, it was fascinating to see how it evolved. There was a strong call to action, that purpose alignment, and um, everybody, you know, just things just, it was just astounding to look at how society supported one another mm. um, yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. Sorry. Now, um, many small businesses don't actually have a human resources department, but most medium and larger organizations will have something that traditionally people refer to as HR. In the last few years, we've started seeing more and more pushback uh, against the term human resources, and we have more and more people growing their realization that, well, actually, humans aren't resources. They shouldn't be referred to as resources. And some people think in terms of capability. So you hear and people talk about people and capability or talent acquisition or, or something like that. The general notion here is value humans, value people, value individuals. And when you say value, don't just think money, money, right? Value means genuine connection, genuine appreciation for each other. And this department focused on people uh, and people capability for the organization has a profound role in encouraging and supporting an effective culture of articulating the purpose of the organization well, communicating it well to prospective 
employees and uh, contractors, and ensuring that the people that we do engage in the organization are actually um, people that we want to work with, are people that we, we love working with. Very much like uh, most good organizations will actually actively um, chase really good clients. They will want to have good relationships with good clients. Very few people actively pursue bad clients. People then uh, give us a lot of hassle and they don't pay us on time. You don't really want clients like that. You want clients that are a breeze to work with and that they pay you um, right away if you're in an um, sort of commercial context. So developing HR or people and capability as an effective capability, that's really, really essential. Yeah, it's not just part of a, some, a, some other department. It's a capability that spans across the whole organization and everybody mm -hmm. back, practices HR as a capability instead of somebody else doing it in, in a different silo. Yeah. Now, what happens if we overemphasize the organizational purpose to the detriment of humans, well, this is what Al is going to talk to us about. And some of it is really uh, evident if we overemphasize the one. And the first one is, is that personal values are being ignored. Um, uh, the organization just walks over people. People are treated like mushrooms. Uh, you must have heard that, that saying. I'm not going to go into the explanation of it. Um, and that breeds mistrust. And you see all sorts of dysfunctions that we already covered earlier in some of the, um, uh, the balances uh, or the polarities. You start to see a lot more of those types of behaviors. Um, you also notice uh, an inability of anyone to speak truth to power. Um, so that safety is missing. Um, also, uh, questionable purpose. And what we mean by that is the actual purpose is just being of the organization. Um, people are just paying lip service to it, um, uh, as well as the values uh, purpose, uh, and purpose of the organization. So you'll see high powered people saying, yes, we must treat people. Our people is our number one priority, but their actual behaviors speak totally different about how they treat people. For instance, they don't even greet the cleaner. So uh, because they feel so elevated above the, those people. Um, what we also notice is a lot of burnout and the Japanese call it Kiroshi. Um, and this is where we uh, actually can observe how people are burnout. There's a low, a low energy there. Yes, for you. By the way, Kiroshi uh, is death from overwork. People okay. are literally dying out, out of overwork, out of exhaustion. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, so you, you'll see people behaving like drones. The energy, you, that's the first thing you'll notice is the energy would be really low. You also notice that there's a casual uh, casualness about drug and alcohol abuse. Um, you'll see other addictions that people have. Um, and you'll see the good people um, are, are leaving, you know. Um, and um, there's a, a, so, a slight day, suicide and burnout and Karoshi um, has, has got a strong link to uh, emotional well-being in the organization. And that could be from um, having too much of a focus of the organization and ignoring the human element of this. In, I, I grew up in, uh, in the software world. Um, I did programming and testing. I ended up finding out later that I wasn't working with computers or software. I was working with people. And that was a major insight for me in my career to realize that I'm working with people and not computers or software. And then the last thing we see is this what we call fluffy conflict. Um, the, there's quite a lot of um, absence of candor. People don't talk about the elephant in the room. Nobody calls out that the emperor is now closed because there's no safety to do so. So those are the types of downsides for over-focusing on the organizational purpose and ignoring the human elements to this. Aurea. 
Now it's time to look at um, what happens when we want to retain good benefit of personal interest in the context of a good appreciation of organizational purpose. So if I'm personally well motivated and in alignment with the organizational purpose, yes, I have a really good sense of belonging. I have a high motivation. I can take pride in my contribution. I can wake up every morning and go, whoo, get goosebumps. We're doing amazing things. Um, it's going to be fantastic. Um, I can also see a lot of um, development. I grow. Um, my skills, my abilities develop really, really well. You see fast development of ability and effectiveness. What happens is in organizations where people are really well aligned is um, you have a lot of mentoring happening. A lot of people pairing up, learning from one another, and therefore skill levels skyrocket. Very quickly, people become really, really effective. We take pride in achieving great things, and therefore it becomes not at all unusual for some teams in some organizations to become hyperproductive. You have, oh, you achieve in a week what others might take a half a year or more to achieve. Um, there's also... A, a sense of, of higher purpose. You have a really strong emotional connection, a really strong um, alignment. You engage in the habits, the practices, the, the discipline of developing professional mastery. And um, you don't feel that it's some form of a, a chore or a burden because this higher purpose is actually calling you to it and you're actively anticipating it. You're, you're having a really good integration. Now, um, what we need to be mindful of is remember that it's not just the work. In other words, we need to be mindful not to over correct in terms of this, this higher purpose. And then you forget about your, your, your home life, if you will, you don't be, become so absorbed just in the work and you're there kind of 20 out of the 24 hours, uh, 24 hours of the day. No, you want to figure out a good work-life integration because otherwise, again, we end up in the burnout um, problem that we had previously. You want to refresh yourself well. You want to learn about the importance of recovery. Yeah. So um, these are some of the elements that give us um, the opportunity to, to thrive and do really well by integrating personal and organizational intention and purpose. So what happens when these are hitting that thriving zone? What happens when both the personal interest and the organizational purpose are in really good alignment? Um, and this uh, is a summary of what we found with the panels that we worked with. The first one is, is that you notice there's joyful work. You can see people are enjoying it. You can see them having an ikigai moment. You can see them in flow. You, you notice it. It, you, it, it's, it is something that you can taste in the ear. It is so palpable. You also see that this strong alignment, people know exactly where they stand in relation to the organizational purpose. They know exactly how their personal values align with the organizational purpose. You notice that when you work with charities, um, we've worked with a few charities, this is one of the key things that we notice whether the charity has got a strong purpose is by observing how the people align their own personal values with the organizational purpose that that is alignment is visible you can you can actually see it in action the next thing that we notice is clarity everybody knows why the organization exists they're able to explain it and what's more is they're able to explain how they contribute to that that clarity is really really key um, a few years ago, I helped a big bank um, with a project that was in trouble. 
and they brought in a lot of uh, junior people to come and test the software with a month to go before they went live. And one thing that I noticed was that the, these people that, that came in as graduates, they had no idea why they were there. They couldn't link what they were doing to the purpose of the bank or the purpose of the software product that they were building. All I needed to do was actually create that link for them and say, this software does this for these people, for the organization. And you could see the lights going on. And we got a lot of really good um, uh, motivation and commitment from that, for, for just from doing that one little thing. Interesting that the middle word there says thriving people and organizations. So you'll see both people and the organization. There's thriving, there's continuous revival in the organization. You'll notice that when you've got that alignment happening. Lots of adaptability. Um, and this comes to as the, the organization, the organization's customers is, are changing or the, the, the needs of the customers are changing, you'll see a proactive adjustment about let's change the product, let's kill the product, let's start give this to our customers, it's etc. And then lastly, the, the, the stuff below here has, has all got to do with human connections. Um, there's lots of celebrating learning. Um, there's an example of an organization, uh, it's a, a Swedish music streaming service. There's examples of them actually celebrating mistakes they've made, acknowledging it and actually celebrating the learning that it provided them. The interesting thing there, um, Borea, is we, I see that we've got Haka there at the bottom. Now, if you're not a rugby fan, you wouldn't really know uh, if you've, what the All Blacks is about. Uh, but the Haka is uh, one of the signature things they do in uh, um, ahead of every international game they play. And it comes from the region where I'm staying. And literally, the Hakka was devised many, many years ago by the Maori chief, to, uh, by the Maori um, tribe that lived uh, about a kilometer away from my house. And it's called Kamate. And um, that has got a significant, a big significance for the the tribe then it was the signature uh, not just a war cry but a declaration of who they are but you you see that every organization has got a similar type of um, uh, what do you call it is it a practice is it a, a habit or something like that where they're really proud about who they are mm -hmm. um, uh, and they're proud to put it on display. So that's the type of, uh, of things. I'm, I'm working for this organization or something like that is you see that pride in, in people. And that's why the word Hakka there, it's got really deep meaning uh, for uh, in, in New Zealand for, for, for the people. It's not just a war cry. It's, a, it's an identity that, that you align with and it's got meaning behind it as well. So you'll see all of these types of um, habits, behaviors, and some of it is not really visible, but you can sense it. There's, there's a deep sense that these people know what they're doing. They, 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 they enjoy this. They find joy in what they're doing. Mm. So Haka is a challenge. Haka is an invitation, a, a calling forth. Uh, to say, show me your spirit. This is my spirit. What, uh, what do you bring? Um, it's a way of inviting um, a vibrant flourishing together. It's a way of, uh, of seeing that we do really well together. Thank you for that clarification, Horia. Hmm. You can see who's been in New Zealand longer. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. No sweat. Yeah. Now, um, these potential fears, the things that we want to avoid when um, considering personal interest and organizational purpose. Well, we have challenges around threats to the ego, right? 
So um, fear of missing out, uh, loss of status, loss of power, fear of ridicule, uh, all of these things may turn things um, into, into difficulties, into drama for us. There might also be threats to the organization, uh, all sorts of um, behaviors from people in authority that could be classified as toxic leadership. Um, there's all sorts of um, challenge there in terms of managing reputations, um, political maneuvering, um, character assassinations. Um, in recent years, all this um, social media um, cancellation and so on. Um, Groupthink and related um, challenges, uh, ignoring um, people that are more quiet, the, the, the introverts, not um, taking into account their perspective, not inviting their, their perspectives. So there's a lot of difficulty that, um, that we can face when we're not actively managing the good alignment of personal uh, interest and the organizational purpose. Fortunately, there are quite a few skills and techniques and approaches that we can draw upon to get better, to keep in good balance. Thank you, Horia. The very first one is fun at work. And yes, for those of you that don't know it, you may have fun at work and you can quote us on that. Um, you spend a big amount of your time at the workplace uh, a big amount of your life at the workplace, you may as well have a fun workplace because there are things that you sometimes take from work to home. And if you're in a good environment, it is just so much better for when you step out of that environment. It, 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 it just makes life a lot easier uh, for your family uh, as well. So, um, there are a few things that you can do to make fun at work. Have a happiness engineer, for instance. Um, yeah, uh, have a happiness uh, director, I don't know. Um, but it is a really valuable thing. Happy people um, deliver better. You have better customer engagement with them, etc. cetera. Um, just look at how Richard Branson and them uh, work, uh, work, the, some of the principles is if you take care of the people, then they will take care of your customers. There's some of those types of principles in play. Here's Aurea. One really important thing to emphasize, we're not suggesting that organizations should or must practice all of these skills and habits. This is more like um, an encyclopedia or a pantry from which you can pick different kinds of ingredients. This idea of a happiness engineer, some people will take to it like ducks to water. They will love the idea, they will practice it well, and they will get great results. Other people, depending on their temperament, might see it with intense suspicion. What do you mean a happiness engineer? Get away from me. I don't want to be sort of pushed into or massaged by a happiness engineer. I don't want to be pushed into attending some ridiculous uh, play or game. I'm here to work. I'm not here to play. Yeah. So um, <laughs> all we're saying is most of these things, they're not to be forced on people. They're to be checked, um, validated with people. How does this resonate with you? Yeah. How interested would you be in, in giving it a try? See how it works. Oh, it works really well. Awesome. Very good. But assuming that just because we're suggesting something, it will never work. Well, how do you know? Yeah, because we've seen it work in certain contexts. Um, it's very interesting, very important to be curious and to be um, empathetic. Um, allow people to have their own brand of fun. Yeah, not everybody has to fit in the same mold. Not everybody has to live the same story. Not everybody has to believe in the same things. Thanks, Aurea. Um, one of the other things is you can go look at what the Japanese uh, do in terms of Hoshin Kanri. Um, go look at some of the practices that they have in play. 
and these are ideas there that you can actually help to bring the organizational purpose and the, or the personal interest uh, in alignment. And then if you've been reading up uh, from Corporate Rebels, if you've heard about Morningstar, if you've heard about uh, Beardsorg, if you've heard about Simco, uh, have you, if you've heard about Menlo Innovations, if you've heard about Hire, there are quite a lot of examples and uh, plays or practices or methods that you can go and explore that could potentially work in your organization. They have playbooks, it's published, um, and there's great ideas uh, of things that you can try to bring the personal interest and organizational purpose in alignment. Um, uh, for instance, from Morningstar is, um, make the mission the boss that's a mantra they have so they they they're, they're responsible towards their their actions are responsible and aligned with the mission instead of to a person uh, which is an interesting uh, twist on things in higher they've got small um, uh, individ individually operating um, small businesses in under the bigger higher brand they call them ZZJYTs and they operate within an ecosystem. And this really helps people to focus on a specific customer. And part of the way that they get remunerated is by being directly responsible to a customer. Everything that little micro business does is responsible to a customer, not to a manager in a hierarchy. It's really interesting uh, stuff uh, in there. There's a lot of ideas from the, the, the School of Theory of Constraints, um, practicing uh, pivoting. Um, there's things from the four day work week or the, the mythical man month. There's a lot of ideas that you can copy uh, and, and use. Important though is be clear about your why. What is the organization's why? And um, there's quite a lot of tools and techniques and uh, uh, capabilities that you look at is to get clarity on the organizational purpose. A vision statement should actually be something that's usable and not just something that um, is just put on a wall on a poster on a wall and everybody ignores it all the time. And there are things like extreme ownership, um, and invitational leadership, uh, they are things to, to explore in this space. Um, and then even li little things like don't waste a good crisis, you see there, <laughs> or don't wait for a crisis to take action in order to maintain that alignment. Um, uh, that are some of the things that you can do in terms of build new habits, look at some practices, what other organizations have done, in order to maintain that balance um, between the two um, balances of personal interest and organizational purpose. And then lastly, Horia, this, this panel exploded in the panel interviews that, that we've had. <laughs> there was quite a lot of warning signs uh, that, that was given uh, when uh, for things to look out for when you know uh, that that can give you early warning when you're falling back into the old imbalance yeah uh one more thing that i wanted to offer a clarification around uh, hoshin kanri uh some people may not be familiar with the with the term um roughly translated in english would be something like strategy deployment and some people refer to the practice of catchball meaning um, an executive community identifies a set of, of mission elements. The mission elements are like a ball that you throw and middle management kind of catches that ball and chops the mission elements into more specific objectives. The objectives get handed over to the teams. Again, the ball kind of gets thrown away, gets caught by the team. The team takes the objectives, cuts them into specific activities, and then the balls kind of get dispersed to individual contributors. They catch the balls, they get the activities completed. Hey, the objectives are met. Hey, the missions are accomplished. Hey, you get your strategy actually achieved. So 
the Hoshin Kanri concept is one of strategically deploying your intentions and keeping track of them so you see how you can actually achieve things. And that's why it's also related to the objectives and key results. Uh, networks and other similar practices. So that's quite a lot to, to explore there. We're going to go into more detail um, into specific techniques, practices, and the backstories behind them in other uh, episodes, depending on audience uh, feedback and interest. We're going to follow your guidance. Now, in terms of warning signs, what are the things that we could notice um, that could indicate that we need to, to take action and balance personal and organizational elements. Well, toxic behaviors like bullying and empire building and various forms of over aggressive behavior, um, they're good signs that something's not quite right. Um, Toxic uh, organization uh, habits of um, ill discipline, uh, high absenteeism, uh, lots of factionalism and tribal aggression, low engagement, uh, burnout, and so on. Um, An overemphasis on, on process, uh, people hiding behind uh, process, um, all sorts of... Um, strange uses of process, uh, process accumulating in vast quantities and never pruned, the absence of the, the skill to kill um, certain elements of process over time. Yeah, um, There may also be, uh, we, we may notice uh, a loss of customer focus. Um, all of a sudden, it looks like we're only caring about the things that matter to us but the customer, who cares about the customer? You, making life easier for the customer? No, 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 no. It's too hard. This is easy for us. We're going to do what's easy for us. Well, when that happens, um, that's not a good sign that we're, we're caring about our customers. Well, we're not going to have a, a really effective, sustainable business. Uh, poor quality um, is another warning sign. Um, we call it here kabuki delivery. Kabuki is a, is a form of uh, Japanese theater that's very formalized, very um, formulaic, um, if you will. And therefore, it's like you're only pretending to deliver as opposed to actually delivering with, with um, good quality. The, the Russians uh, would refer to this as bakazucha. Um, which is, is kind of like a window dressing. You, you pretend that it's okay. Um, um, there's also another famous example of the, uh, the Potemkin uh, villages when uh, the Tsarina was uh, taking a, a cruise down the river Volga. Um, people would uh, put facades of apparently thriving villages uh, by the side of the river. And then overnight, they would disassemble the facades, put them on, um, <clears throat> on carts, cut across, because the river was very meandering. You cut across one of these legs and you reestablish a new village and say, oh, look, see, yet another flourishing village. And as a matter of fact, there were no such villages. It's only facades, facades, facades. And to a certain extent, that's why kind of the communist experiment uh, of the Soviets actually um, fell down the tracks because nobody really cared about genuine, truthful contribution and any form of effective um, competence was seen with, with utter suspicion and rewarded with either death or some time in a, in a gulag far away. So um, the way of engaging with the human spirit and achieving great, uh, great quality um, is really, really important. So you need to be very careful, pay close attention to signals in this space. And how you notice, you notice this in language, um, any kind of coercive language or derogatory language or too much um, sarcasm, um, much uh, violence in, in language. Language informs leadership in, in, in many ways. So again, this is a, a significant topic. 
understanding also um, different flavors of language, the language focused on, on doing versus the language focusing uh, on thinking. And we need to understand the balance between those two. That's again, a huge topic that merits closer attention. So there are, as we see here, lots and lots of signals, lots and lots of opportunities to get better at balancing. Just on the language, one, one thing to look out for is how questions are asked, um, especially by people in power. Um, if you notice that it's really always closed-ended questions, that's a dead giveaway that this is not really balanced. Um, those closed-ended questions don't really give people... Uh, and, and then you look at how people uh, twist themselves into pretzels to answer a yes-no type uh, question. Uh, that, that's quite... That's another giveaway about how people react to those yes, no questions. Um, so uh, language is fascinating to observe because it hides quite a lot be, uh, uh, of nuance about the culture in that organization. Okay. And with that, I think uh, it's a wrap for today. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll so see you soon. Just to, before we do that, Horia, just to summarize again, today we looked at the interplay between personal uh, interest and organizational purpose. And you'll notice that there's quite a lot of habits and uh, methods and frameworks uh, or practices that we've shared. Um, and by all means, again, if we've missed anything, please, contribute we really would like to know what we've missed um, and if you're a specialist in this area or you have very specific examples of how you found the downside of these things and what are some of the things that you've done to lift it where the personal and interest and organizational purpose has been aligned please contact us we'd love to interview you and share your experience and learning with the rest of the world Thank you very much, everybody. Um, this is Aldo Roll from The Focus. And this is Horia Stoshansky. See you soon. Thank you. See you soon.